star is Mr. Kanan, and he's been one of our top 10 fugitives now for several weeks. This is the person that's wanted in the uh, homicide of Mr. Versace. The search for the prime suspect in the Versace killing the is now for a Andrew Kunana, Mr. Kunana, who is wanted for a total of five murders. The FBI is anywhere. describing it as an intense manhunt. <laughs> Everybody's got to help us put this guy in jail. The internet should be considered extremely dangerous and armed at this time. He always wanted to be someone. He wanted to be famous. He wanted to have money. He wanted to have all the toys. I always remember looking at him and going, wow, how does he pull it off? You know, he's really got this energy about him. He did have a real role to him. He was a party fellow. He had this certain laugh about him that could be heard on the other side of the bar. Ha, 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 He was a big teddy bear, always there with a hug and sweet and kind. I would have never in a million years dreamed that Andrew could hurt someone. Andrew Cunanan was a loser. He wanted to be a part of the society, but he wanted to cheat his way into it. I think while all this was going on, Andrew was wondering where he was going to place in the Serial Killer Hall of Fame. began in California, near the Pacific, the ocean whose name means peace. But the life of Andrew Cunanan was anything but peaceful. He spent his life trying to stay one step ahead of everyone else. In his dreams and in his lies, he was an heir to a fortune or an aspiring actor or a witty young man with an ex-wife and daughter. He lived behind stories and half-truths, yet to many friends, to know Andrew Cunanan was to love him. Andrew was outgoing, fun-loving, caring, boisterous, goofy, someone who loved life. He could have been anything. Good morning, FBI. But instead, Andrew Cunanan became one of the most notorious and hunted criminals in America. It would all come to a brutal end inside a Miami Beach houseboat, thousands of miles from where his life began in suburban San Diego, a place where every family worked to try to fulfill the American dream, a dream that Andrew Cunanan would twist into a nightmare. Summer 1969, the sun was setting on a troubled and violent decade. For a brief time, the world looked up in awe and wonder at the promise of a new age as Neil Armstrong took his first steps on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But in San Diego, California, Modesto and Marianne Cunanan had their own reasons for remembering that extraordinary time. That was when they welcomed into the world their youngest child, the last of four children. He was born on August 31st in 1969 in Paradise Valley Hospital. The Cunanans, both Catholic, baptized their boy Andrew Philip, the names of two apostles. His father, Modesto, had come to the United States from the Philippines and was serving in the U.S. Navy. Andrew's mother, Marianne, had been a San Diego telephone operator. The Cunandans lived a routine life in a working-class suburb, National City. It is one of the poorest cities in America. But the Cunandans seemed determined to move up to make a better life for their children, especially for Andrew, Modesto, doted on the boy. Andrew's father paid an awful lot of attention to him uh, and, and I think cultivated in his son a, uh, an interest in uh, education and an interest in the finer things. Um, there, in my recollection is that they uh, had a, uh, uh, a fairly modest existence and, uh, but I, I understood from his father that there was a drive to, to want more. 
1972, Modesto retired from the Navy and got a job as a stockbroker while Mary Ann raised the children. She was deeply religious and she had a powerful influence on Andrew. He read the Bible by age seven, became an altar boy, and for a time thought of becoming a priest. His mother was seen almost every day in church and there was a solemn, almost church-like atmosphere in the Cunanan home as well. It was a very quiet place. Uh, it was almost tomb-like uh, in many ways. Um, and I think for Andrew, it was a stifling environment. When Andrew was nine, his family moved to a better neighborhood, Bonita, and his world was transformed. Between Bonita and National City, the contrasts are just so obvious. Bonita, the majority of the people that lived in Bonita, very comfortable. Most people, Everybody had a swimming pool and rode horses, went on vacations, had their jet skis, their snow skis. It did not take long for Andrew to see the stark difference between the world he left behind in National City and the world he embraced in Bonita. His tastes began to change. Andrew was over at my house and he was complaining because there wasn't any Perrier. And at 13, soda water was like drinking Alka-Seltzer. You know, you just didn't want it. And he was complaining because there wasn't any. And I thought, and I just, 13 years old, complaining there wasn't any Perrier. It's, to me, that was just really bizarre. Well, he would be the type of person that, people back at that time, if they had penny loafers, would put pennies inside their penny loafers. But um, he'd be the type of person that put dimes. It was just like one up on everyone else, you know, just to make himself known. When he was a teenager, his parents moved again to Rancho Bernardo. The Cunanans had climbed one more rung up the economic ladder, but friends remember the Rancho Bernardo house for other reasons. It was uh, basically, by and large, dirt uh, on the backyard, and Andrew used to point through vertical blinds at the back of his house to the backyard. And, tell me about his father uh, doing target practice uh, for the Filipino Mafia, and I would just laugh him off. Modesto and Marianne managed to send their youngest son to one of the most exclusive private schools, the Bishop's School in La Jolla. The tuition, $9,000 a year. There, Andrew began to rub elbows with the sons and daughters of San Diego's elite. This, Andrew felt, was where he belonged. Andrew's the most status conscious person I've ever met to this day. He always wanted to be someone. He wanted to be famous. He wanted to have money. He wanted to have all the toys. He always pretended to have more than he really did, or he wanted you to think he had more than he did. And I just always knew that it wasn't true. It was all fantasy. His classmates also came to know something else about Andrew. He made no secret of the fact that he was attracted to men and would whistle at members of the male water polo team. By some reports, he even began having liaisons with older, wealthy men. He developed affectations, telling friends his favorite TV show was Brideshead Revisited, and at times he even carried around a teddy bear, like the character Sebastian. Andrew could be colorful and exuberant among his friends, but some saw his behavior as little more than an act. I believed uh, probably 10% of what Andrew said, and 90% of it I wrote off to Andrew wanting attention. Even down to his homosexuality, I thought that was an act. Um, and, I, and really, I think that uh, ultimately Andrew uh, was not gay. Um, as insane as that may sound, uh, I think Andrew found an act that was convenient for getting attention, and the sexual aspects of, of his life had nothing to do with that act. In 1987, Andrew Cunanan graduated from the Bishop's School. His classmates voted the outrageous 18-year-old the most likely to be remembered. Certainly, they would not forget his yearbook page. While his classmates filled the pages with their accomplishments, Andrew's entry was nearly empty. Others listed their hometowns, not Andrew. He seemed intent on covering up what he did and where he came from. 
Instead, there was just a quote from the 18th century in the court of Louis XV. Après moi, le déluge. After me, the storm. It would take nearly a decade for his classmates and the world to fully grasp how devastating that storm would be. By 1987, Andrew Cunanan had gone from the lower class streets of National City to the comfortable avenues outside La Jolla. He had no intention of stopping there. After graduating from the Bishop School, he entered the University of California at San Diego, where he majored in history. But soon his own history would be altered forever. In October of 1988, a warrant was issued for the arrest of Andrew's father. Modesto Cunanan was charged with embezzlement and became a fugitive. He fled the country and returned to the Philippines. Andrew's mother, Mary Ann, was forced to live on food stamps. Andrew's carefully cultivated life crumbled. Soon after, he dropped out of school. Andrew went to visit his father, but quickly returned to the United States, disgusted, he said, because his father was living in squalid conditions. With that, Andrew began to turn his back once and for all on the world in which he'd grown up. He would create a new life centered around wealthy, often closeted gay men, men who took him to expensive dinner parties. He developed a routine. Let us say Andrew was one of these parties and he found out that a certain wealthy millionaire closet, uh, closeted man collected orchids. That night when Andrew went home, he went and got every book he could on orchids. He was continuing the social climbing that had begun years before in suburban Bonita. His fantasies of life among the well-to-do were fulfilled, but getting there required more than just making connections. Andrew Cunanan had become a gigolo, a kept man. Andrew had one benefactor at a time, one major benefactor. And these relationships, uh, they lasted for a while. Um, and Andrew made sure that they lasted for a while by keeping their interests. That was only part of the Andrew Cunanan mystique. He made friends his own age in San Diego's gay community of Hillcrest, where the outrageous Andrew from the Bishop School could dance bare-chested on tables and buy rounds of drinks for everyone. When he was with his friends in the bar, you know, there would be like tricks he would play on the bar and there would be like times where he'd snag somebody's hat off of some young cute guy and run across the, gar run across the bar and put it on, an on another guy and make that guy have to chase him to go get that hat. I mean, those were silly little pranks that he was famous for. The young man who relied on the money and influence of benefactors could act as a benefactor to others. He enjoyed the fact that he was given out to people his own age, or it was almost like Robin Hood, you know, stealing from the rich and giving to the poor sort of thing. I don't know. That's how I see it. But I think Andrew was more or less very happy and very, very thrilled to be treating people that he thoroughly and generally enjoyed hanging out with. He could be generous with his affection as well as his money. Andrew always, always was the first one to run up and give you a hug. In fact, um, that's the th a thing I'll remember forever. I can still, in my mind, hear the way he would greet me and come at me with these open arms and Sheila and a big hug. And, and it was that way for everybody. Everybody got a hug and a kiss. He had a zest for living and a laugh to match. I've worked very hard on uh, doing Andrew's laugh and it is so unique that I can't even do it but uh, it is uh, it's a hearty uh, hyena like uh, belt sort of like a Tarzan getting poked in the rear with a pin uh, ha, 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 ha. but that's uh, not quite there but that's as close as I can get Andrew seemed to be on stage, and in these performances, he rarely let people get close. He could disappear into whatever role he chose to play. Andrew told some people he was an aspiring actor or a designer. He even reinvented his family. 
he spoke about his mother and how when he would have a problem or, or something he needed to speak with her about, on occasion as a youth, he would go to her, but she was so consumed by her society lady duties and the, the choreography of a fashion show that was upcoming that she shunned him and he was, uh, he was excluded. He told some that he came from a rich Jewish family or that his father owned a home on the Riviera and it could get even more incredible. He also spoke of having an ex-wife and a young daughter and in fact at one point in time produced photographs to document this uh, theory and they were taken in the most beautiful home. Some friends knew him as Andrew Cummings. Most were told his name was Andrew De Silva. He became an enigma, a blend of so many fictions, it was impossible for anyone to know who he really was. A few did get close to him. One was a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, Jeffrey Trail. The two became almost like brothers. You, you heard the admiration when he talked about Jeff. I know that there was def a definite bond between Andrew and Jeff and that they were really close friends, the best of friends. Then there was architect David Madsen from Minnesota. The two met while Madsen was visiting friends in San Francisco and soon became involved. Andrew told friends Madsen was the love of his life. But Andrew knew only one way to support himself. He took up with another so-called benefactor, Norman Blatchford, a businessman in his late 60s. He kept Andrew in a $900,000 home and gave him an allowance, reportedly $2,500 a month. For Andrew, National City must have seemed a distant memory. But by the fall of 1996, it was all about to end. Andrew's relationships began to dissolve. Madsen had lost interest in Andrew, partly, it seems, out of fear. He was wondering about where Andrew Cunanan was getting this money. He thought it was very strange that Andrew would not give him a phone number where he could reach him. And he also wouldn't even give him an address in San Diego. Uh, and so that's why uh, David felt that there was something weird about Andrew and something sinister and something shady. In the fall, Jeff Trail decided to take a job as a manager for a propane delivery company. He ended up moving to Minnesota, near David Madsen. Jeffrey Trail is highly respected, didn't know a lot of people here in Minnesota. And apparently, Andrew suggested that he get in touch with David Madsen. And David Madsen actually uh, helped show him around town. Around this time, Andrew's relationship with Blatchford came to an end. Suddenly, money was hard to come by. I was talking to him one night at the bar, and he told me that he'd gone to this one particular straight bar, and there aren't that many in Hillcrest. And I was totally alarmed because I was like, well, what are you doing there? And he looked at me and he goes, oh, you don't know? He goes, that's where I do most of my business. I put two and two together and knew that he was selling drugs. Friends suspected he was also taking drugs. They also heard he was getting into sadomasochism. He went to some after-hours place, and he did get into some leather, in the, in the leather and S&M and so forth. And Andrew was, was a master in, in that scene, and the yes, sadomasochist scene. So Andrew always had to be controlled, even sexually. Andrew began to put on weight. Even his demeanor seemed to change. I saw Andrew last New Year's this past year, and I was so excited to see him again because I hadn't seen him in like eight months or so and it, it was very strange because he was different. I didn't get the Sheila and the, and the big hug. It was, oh hi, how you doing? A little hug and passing and, and on he went. In April of 1997, Jeffrey Trail told a friend in Minnesota that he had had a huge falling out with Andrew. I made a lot of enemies this weekend, Trail said. I've got to get out of here. They're going to kill me. Jeffrey Trail uh, uh, had a lot of uh, apprehension about uh, 
how he felt about uh, Andrew Cunan, and he felt he had a very dark side to him. He was, uh, uh, he didn't feel very comfortable with him. Uh, and I, we think, we theorize that uh, perhaps he told David Madsen, uh, you know, stay away from Andrew Cunan, uh, you know, don't get involved with him. Andrew, however, was not prepared to stay away from them. He told friends he was moving to San Francisco, but first he said he had some business in Minneapolis. And I said to him, I said, well, you know what, you'll be back. And I said that to Andrew, and he looked at me and he goes, trust me, you don't know me, I won't be back. The night before he left, some friends hosted a party for him at a favorite restaurant, a last supper for a departing friend. At one point, it was most peculiar, uh, there was almost silence after talking about the attitudes people had established, whether they knew Andrew well or not at all. And he gave the retort that, in fact, nobody really knew who he was, that everyone had their own version of who he was, but nobody really knew the truth. The next day, Andrew Cunanan left for Minneapolis. He had spent his 27 years striving to be someone better, someone richer. He had measured his life by fashion magazines, dinner menus, and street addresses, by what he could show or show off. His life story was constantly being rewritten, but now the next terrifying chapter was about to unfold. Cunanan left San Diego for Minneapolis on April 25th, it seemed he wasn't trying to close a chapter of his life as much as attempting to reopen one. Minneapolis was the home of David Madsen, Andrew's former lover. And some of the friends who found out that Andrew was visiting that April weekend said, why are you letting him stay with you? Why are you seeing him? And David Madsen told them, well, Andrew's having a tough time. I just want to help him out. He's not going to stay with me the whole weekend. That night, Andrew and Madsen went out for dinner with some of David's friends from work. And they found Cunanan's behavior odd. This was not the exuberant Andrew of San Diego. I was harassing David for what he was wearing, got a, a look across the table from Andrew and a very serious look, and he said, boy, you're, you're really quite the bitch. And I stopped in my tracks. Two nights later, on April 27th, Andrew invited over Jeffrey Trail, his close friend from San Diego, who had recently moved to Minneapolis. But the reunion of the three friends was less than pleasant. That night, Madsen's neighbors heard an argument coming from his apartment. We know that neighbors say that they heard a lot of loud yelling. Uh, they heard thumping. One neighbor said that around this time, he heard somebody say, get the F out. The next day, Andrew and Madsen were seen walking Madsen's dog as if nothing had happened the night before. But when Madsen failed to show up for work that day and the next, the friends who went out to dinner with him and Andrew began to worry. They go up to his door and they bang on the door. They both think that they hear whispering inside the apartment. And they're knocking on the door saying, David, come out, what's going on? But they think maybe something private is going on. A few hours later, Madsen's friends were still worried they called the police. Inside Madsen's apartment, the police found the bludgeoned body of Jeffrey Trail, wrapped in a carpet. We believe he was uh, struck several times with uh, a hammer, uh, a claw hammer, which happened to be lying nearby. Uh, he was struck numerous times uh, in the head, uh, causing a, a considerable amount of uh, damage and injury to his skull. Cunanan and Madsen had vanished. But four days later, on May 3rd, two fishermen found David Madsen's body by East Rush Lake, 50 miles north of Minneapolis. Madsen had been shot in the head and the back with a 40 caliber pistol. 
Cunanan became the suspect in both murders, and as the news reached San Diego, Cunanan's friends who knew him there as Andrew De Silva were stunned. It was Andrew Cunanan's name, along with Andrew De Silva's picture, that threw us into emotional tailspin and the layers of fabricated years of what we felt were his history here started to fall by the wayside and the truth, the uh, devastatingly disturbing truth, reared its ugly head. A number of David Matson's friends believe that Jeffrey Trail was telling David some things about Andrew Cunanan and about Andrew Cunanan's life in San Diego that David Matson did not know about. Suddenly, all of Cunanan's friends feared for their lives. Maybe he was going to go after all his friends, you know, and, and I think that, that drove the fear more than anything. If you can kill the two closest people to you, you can kill anybody. But Andrew Cunanan did not come after his friends in San Diego. Instead, he headed east, driving David Madsen's Jeep to Chicago. There, it appears he went to the Gold Coast townhouse of Chicago real estate tycoon Lee Miglin. On May 4th, the police found Miglin's body in his garage. Miglin had been stabbed repeatedly in the chest with garden shears. His throat was slashed with a saw blade. His head was wrapped in masking tape, resembling the bondage masks worn in S&M films. $2,000 was missing, along with several expensive suits and Miglin's 1994 Lexus. That night, the police discovered a red Jeep Cherokee around the corner from Miglin's townhouse. The car was identified as belonging to David Madsen. Andrew Cunanan was now the prime suspect in three murders. Police believe Lee Miglin was a stranger to Cunanan. And the question remained, why would Andrew Cunanan murder him? Did Cunanan kill Miglin for the money? Or did he kill Miglin because he had a grudge against him? Literally, because he detested so much what he couldn't have but found so attractive in the victim. The success, the celebrity, the wealth. Flowers continue to arrive. Friends and well-wishers continue to stop by the Miglin's Gold Coast townhouse. And the questions remain. The media across the country were now reporting on a trail of terror. The papers and the airwaves were filled with theories about his M.O. In a spree killer, as we have with Andrew Cunanan, the spree killer will select victims, oftentimes in the beginning, that he's knowledgeable with, uh, has associated with, and from that point, his victims become anybody, any place, any time. Whatever might have driven Andrew Cunanan, whether it was revenge, an insatiable need for recognition, or both, the rampage of terror was far from over. As Cunanan wound his way east, the storm continued. By May 5th, 1997, Andrew Cunanan was a man on the run, suspected of murdering three men in cold blood within one week, and a man who seemingly behaved as though he thought he could get away with it. Instead of hiding in some secluded, out-of-the-way place, Cunanan headed to New York City only one day after the murder of Chicago millionaire Lee Miglin. Well, you know, I think we have this stereotypic image of the serial killer as kind of a glassy-eyed lunatic, kind of like the ones that we see in slasher films. Uh, actually, they're not like that at all. They have an uncanny ability to look like everybody else. And that's why Cunanan was so difficult to detect. Like most visitors to the Big Apple, Cunanan went shopping. The young man, known for his sophisticated taste, shopped along elegant 57th Street, visiting the original Levi's store. And he went to the movies at least twice. And there's evidence that he also visited this club in the Chelsea district. But on May 8th, Cunanan hit the road again. 
still driving the 1994 Lexus stolen from Lee Miglin. Cunanan was brazen enough to use the car's cellular phone. The police intercepted two calls made just outside Philadelphia. That next morning, the Philadelphia police held a news conference at about 11 o'clock, announcing that Andrew Cunanan had used Lee Miglin's cell phone in the Lexus in the Philadelphia area. Obviously, Cunanan was listening to his radio, heard it, and said, I've got to get rid of this car. Not long after, Cunanan abandoned the Lexus at a cemetery in southern New Jersey. According to authorities, Cunanan shot and killed William Reese, the caretaker of the cemetery, then drove off in Reese's pickup truck. The death toll had now grown to four victims, and with the body count mounting, Andrew Cunanan's infamy reached a new level. The FBI placed him on its 10 most wanted list, and the television program America's Most Wanted spread the word. Look carefully at this picture. It's the most recent photograph of Andrew Cunanan, who police believe is responsible for a two-week killing spree that's claimed four innocent lives. Experts don't believe the killing is over. But, uh... South Beach, Miami, Florida. It's believed Andrew Cunanan arrived there on May 12th. And to him, it could be the perfect place to hide out. It's one of the hottest sort of strips in America. Models, movie stars, uh, uh, a lot of media. And so it, it's some place where it's a place where he would have felt comfortable um, and uh, where he could have easily uh, mingled with people in bars and, uh, and felt at home. Cunanan checked into the Normandy Plaza Hotel and was, according to the hotel's employees, a quiet, unassuming guest. Even though there was a manhunt on for him, Cunanan lived at the hotel day after day, week after week, as spring turned into summer. But by July 7th, it appears Cunanan was running out of money. He went to this pawn shop and sold a gold coin belonging to Chicago murder victim Lee Miglin. Surprisingly, Cunanan filled out a form, signing his real name and giving a thumbprint. And I said, sign here, put your fingerprint, I give you his copy, I give you the money, and he left. That's it. It, it took like a five, six minutes. The shop's manager, by law, sent a copy of the form to the police who were required to review it. But due to a backlog of paperwork, it went unnoticed. Cunanan was spotted again on July 11th in this sandwich shop when one of the cashiers recognized him from watching America's Most Wanted and called 911. When he came in front of me, and when I was watching the show, you know, I pay attention, and it's just, boom, right then and there, it just clicked. But Cunanan left before the police showed up, and despite as many as 10 reported sightings in the area, he continued roaming through Florida. And it's believed he spent time monitoring one of Miami's most prominent residents, a man considered responsible for the funky world of South Beach, and the trendy, sophisticated lifestyle Andrew Cunanan aspired to. Fashion designer Johnny Versace. I think the, the investigation will show out that he had reasons to contact Versace, possibly for money, possibly for shelter, uh, possibly to, uh, to be aided in getting out of the country. On the morning of July 15th, Versace took his usual morning stroll to the news cafe and bought magazines and coffee. On his return to his villa, just as he put his keys into the front gate, someone walked up from behind and shot him twice in the head. Yes, the man's been shot. Please, immediately, please. Okay, hold on. How did he get shot, sir? I don't know. He's walking in front of his home. It's Johnny Versace. I saw Gianni Versace laying face down on his steps with his head blown off, with his face shot off. Looked like execution style, shot in the head right on his steps where that blood is. As the gunman fled, several people, including Versace's longtime companion, Antonio D'Amico, chased after him. But they were frightened away when he waved a gun at them. At Miami's Jackson Memorial Hospital, Gianni Versace was pronounced dead.
And with the news, there was an outpouring of grief. Not long after, authorities found the pickup truck, which was then identified as belonging to William Reese, the murdered New Jersey cemetery caretaker. Inside the truck was a wealth of evidence linking Cunanan to the murders. They found uh, clothing, uh, blood-soaked clothing. He also left identification. He left uh, a passport. He left uh, receipts from uh, visits to, uh, uh, to, to, to a movie theater, uh, I believe, in New York. Uh, he left a trove of evidence. With this evidence in hand, the FBI and the Miami Beach police believed they had their prime suspect in the murder of Johnny Versace. Miami Beach police investigators, in cooperation with agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, are currently looking for Andrew Philip Cunanan as a suspect in the murder of Gianni Versace. Cunanan should be considered extremely dangerous and armed at this time. Andrew Cunanan was about to become the most hunted man in America, a man suspected of brutal exploits that would put him in the deranged company of Charles Manson, Jeffrey Dahmer, and Ted Bundy. And when he joined that select group, Andrew Cunanan finally achieved the level of notoriety for which he had been striving his entire life. Andrew Cunanan, the brash kid who craved the spotlight, the one whom classmates had labeled most likely to be remembered, was suddenly not just famous, but infamous. His name and face were plastered on storefronts, on the front pages of newspapers, and on television newscasts around the world. Continua la masiva búsqueda de Andrew Cunanan. Hundreds of agents in southern Florida searching for the killer of designer Johnny Versace. Hundreds of tips are coming into the FBI. The FBI is reaching out to anyone. Police say Cunanan, who is wanted for a total of five murders, could be anywhere. Nobody's safe in this, and that's the point we have to, we have to get across. Everybody's at risk. Everybody's got to help us put this guy in jail. You said he got on at the Logan Airport uh, stop? OK. Soon, there were sightings, tips from around Florida and from places as varied as Michigan and New Hampshire and Wisconsin. Hundreds of calls from people saying they had seen someone who looked like Andrew Cunanan. But authorities conceded that could mean anything. For a while, they even speculated he was dressing as a woman. But the truth is, no one could be certain. A few days after the Versace killing, vital clues began to turn up. Investigators searched the Normandy Plaza Hotel, where a worker believed Andrew had been staying under a name similar to one of his aliases. I get the creep, you know, because the guy was very nice. You cannot think nothing wrong about that guy. Believe me. When police searched his room, they found fashion magazines and a set of hair clippers. Police seemed to be on Andrew's trail, but no one could predict where that trail would lead. With the Versace killing on everyone's mind, authorities tightened security at fashion shows in New York. Nobody knew where Andrew Cunanan might strike next. Time stoppers. At one point, more than a thousand tips a day were pouring in from around the country. 400 a day in South Florida alone. Many came from the area off Collins Avenue in Miami Beach, where yachts and houseboats are docked. Investigators began to step up surveillance in the area. They became more convinced that Andrew Cunanan had not fled Florida. On Wednesday, July 23rd, Fernando Carrera stopped by to check on a large blue houseboat where he worked as a caretaker. The owner was away on business, and Carrera routinely looked in on the houseboat every couple of days. But this day, the caretaker noticed a lock missing from the front door. Before he could investigate further, he heard a gunshot. Carrera ran outside and called 911. Within the hour, streets were sealed off, heavily armed police moved into the area, and a tense standoff began. We didn't 
don't know exactly what we have on our hands here, but I will tell you for sure this is something big. Local television programs followed the unfolding drama and reported on the speculation that the stranger in the houseboat just might be Andrew Cunanan. Everybody involved in the search for Andrew Cunanan are at this scene and firmly believe this must be him or they would be elsewhere right now. Soon, authorities shut off electricity in the area. For four hours, police waited and watched. Finally, they fired tear gas into the boat. Here we go, guys. Here we go. Through the clouds of smoke, they searched. Upstairs, in the master bedroom, they found a man wearing only boxer shorts, lying face up on the bed. On his stomach, a 40 caliber gun. The man had what looked like a week's growth of beard. He had shot himself in the mouth. After several hours, authorities matched the fingerprints on the body to those from the pawn shop. It was Andrew Cunanan. All across the nation, our citizens can stand down and breathe a sigh of relief. The reign of terror brought upon us by Andrew Cunanan is over. And so it ended, a life that had begun amid the working class immigrants of National City that had sought glitter and money and good times in the bars and mansions of San Diego, that had cultivated fine clothes and fascinating friendships, that life ended in a Miami Beach houseboat, half naked, hungry, and alone. We uh, built uh, Cunanan up in the media somewhat as this sort of cool uh, character uh, who was, uh, you know, calmly uh, eluding uh, this massive dragnet. But you have to imagine that, uh, that Cunanan must have felt a lot of fear. The long climb ended with a terrifying and bloody fall. Police believe Andrew Cunanan left behind five victims, six grieving families, including his own, and many unanswered questions. In uh, learning about Andrew Cunanan, uh, the one thing that kept coming uh, to the surface is this flamboyant, uh, egotistical individual uh, who uh, continued to uh, spend a lot of money and, uh, in this case, uh, forgot to leave the ultimate tip. Uh, that being why he did what he did. The sensationalism hasn't died down yet, but once it does, he's just another common criminal. That's all he is. He's nothing special. He's just a common, he's just a common thug. I think his friends will remember him as the fun, loving guy that he was. Somebody who loved life and always had a good time and always had a smile and always had time for a friend. He wanted a legacy of, here are my accomplishments, respect me, uh, love me, be affectionate towards me. Uh, and instead, we're all left puzzled. What motivated you, Andrew? Why did you do what you did? The man who made his life a series of stories and secrets may have taken the greatest secret with him, the secret of why.